Hi, it's Maria here with you again today and you're very welcome back to join me while I read the next chapter of my new book, The Portal of Zebulon, which has yet to be published as an e-book and in hard copy and uh, hopefully I will have it out soon. I'm currently working on the cover and editing the book as I read it. So um, as I'm reading these chapters aloud, I have just been editing them only moments before. I'm still going through the editing process. So it could change a little bit in the final edition, but it'll only be just tweaking it in, in places here and there. Um, today we've, we're moving on to chapter 13. And this is the halfway mark. The book has 26 chapters, so thankfully we're halfway through the book and coming to really exciting parts as the story goes on its way. Um, catching up today, we've got uh, Kerry and Simon, of course. Um, they're on their mission. They're heading to Zebulon to reopen the portal there. And all the powers of darkness are doing their very best to stop them. But today we're going to pick up the story uh, on chapter 13 with Malachi and Malachi is leaving Rumbert Manor and uh, he's been there with his new assistant Raggy Hugglebuck, uh, a very unusual frumpet from the forest and uh, they have very successfully with Raggy's help um, they have defended the portal and they've set a trap for the vultures and the terrible Demetrius and now Malachi is attempting to get away from Raggy and head off to the land of fire where the third portal lies and he wants to defend the power of the third portal. So don't forget to like and subscribe and share. We go now to chapter 13, it's called Malachi. The winds blew in Malachi's favour as he travelled across land and sea. The prophet preferred to travel alone but it was clear to him that Raggy Hugglebuck had disobeyed him and was following in his footsteps once again. Several times he doubled back on his tracks to catch his shadow. Eventually Malachi laid a trap for Raggy on a remote mountain pass. There was only one way to cross the dangerous ledge and Raggy fell for it. As he crawled over the precipice, Malachi hooked him with his cipher. I thought I told you to stay in Rumbert Manor, said the prophet in an angry voice. But Mrs. Rumbert doesn't like me. She took me to the bathroom again and brought a huge scrubbing brush with her. She was right to do it. You still stink, Raggy. It's humiliating for a mature man of my age to be treated like a small child. You wouldn't like it, Malachi, if someone like her tried to take off all your clothes and throw your naked body into... Enough, said Malachi. What's that in your pocket? It's nothing. I, I Give it to me or I will bring you straight back to Mrs. Rumbert and deliver you into her hands myself. Reluctantly, Raggy took a small blue bottle out of his pocket. Malachi prized it open and took a whiff of its contents. Forest Jew, he exclaimed. This stuff is lethal. I thought you frumpets had stopped making it years ago. Raggy hung his head in shame. Give it up, Raggy. It will destroy your mind and leave you subject to hallucinations and evil fantasies. If you want to stay with me, you must be clean and fully alert. This journey is not for people with confused minds. I promise I won't touch it again. When I'm with you, I have the strength to keep away from temptation. Please let me stay with you, Prophet. I'm a better man when I follow you. All right. I'll allow you to travel with me if you give up the forest Jew. For good and keep yourself out of trouble. You proved yourself to be a useful assistant against the vultures in the Swish Tree Forest. And you've got a special talent for climbing walls and roofs. You're usually silent and observant and have an aptitude for def uh, detective work. I see great potential in you, Raggy, but now we must move quietly and leave no tracks in our wake. As Raggy fell into line with Malachi, their progress was swift. They reached the remote northern territories of the Land of Fire just after dawn. As a darkened sun rose, they ascended the foothills of Mount Grave. 
and headed towards the white chapel. The sky was a greyish yellow and huge clouds billowed across it. In the distance, the volcano was spewing smoke. Every now and then, Malachi heard a low rumble coming from the heart of the mountain. He knew that the Witch of Anver was stirring things up. Then he spotted a lone figure hiking on a distant ridge and smiled. You stay here, Reggie, and keep an eye on that volcano, said Malachi. Now I've got to go and talk to somebody. Down on the ridge, the lone figure of a young sandy-haired man continued his ascent. Luke had spent three years living on the deserted mountains of the Northern Territories of the Land of Fire with an isolated community of hermits. It was a big change from the life that he had once led in the great fire city. He worked as one of the guardians of the portal of the White Chapel and it had been satisfying and peaceful. Even the Witch of Anver hadn't bothered him much until recently. For the first two years, the witch kept to herself and never came near the hermitage. But over the past few months, things had changed. Strangers now crossed, crossed over the mountain pass into the foothills, coming to and from the northern and southern territories of the Land of Fire. Their leader was a deathly pale giant. He rode a grey horse and wore a white mantle. The hermits had seen him in the fields around the White Chapel in the company of the witch. Every time he appeared, the witch grew more powerful. Now she was raiding the hermits' crops and killing goats and chickens almost on a weekly basis. Luke found that he was spending more and more of his time guarding the chapel's farmland and herds. He feared for the lives of the older brothers in the community. They were terrified of the witch. Luke was still enjoying his early morning climb when he saw a hooded figure approaching him from the heights of the mountain. At first he thought it was one of the intruders, but then he recognised Malachi's familiar gait. He was relieved that the prophet had returned. It had been months since they had last seen each other. Malachi made quick work of crossing a jagged outcrop and with a few swift strides he came face to face with Luke. The young man was delighted to see his mentor and friend. I've been looking for the Witch of Anver, said Malachi. I think she's deliberately avoiding me. But I also came here to talk to you, Luke. As the two men descended the mountain together, Malachi shared his news about the fall of Zebulon City. I know you are restless here, Luke. You are questioning whether the life of solitude is the one for you. Now is the time for change. I have an important task for you. You must go to Zebulon to reopen the portal and restore order to the east. The world needs you. You're right, Malachi. I've been waiting for this, said Luke, and I'm honoured that you've chosen me for the job. I hope that I can live up to your expectations. You're one of the few people I can trust with this, Luke, said Malachi, and I know you're a man who won't give up. You have a pure heart and you're not easily taken in. There are not many like you. I have my weaknesses, Malachi, as you know well. Everyone has weaknesses, but I know what's in your heart. You'd give your life to save another. You will also be a good leader for that impulsive Simon Mackin and his sister Kerry. They need your support. It's been peaceful here, Malachi. I'll miss the life here. Three years is enough to be away from the world, Luke. Now it's time for you to go. Luke studied the prophet. Are you sure I'm the one? Yes, my son. This is what you were born to do. And what about the hermits? They need someone to defend them against the witch. They're old and sick. Leave the witch to me, said Malachi. I'll deal with her. As he spoke, a huge plume of smoke erupted from the mountain peak and flashes of lightning lit up the sky. Sparks of flaming molten rock spewed up into the heavens. The mountain erupted. She's stirring it up, said Malachi. The mountain shuddered and Luke almost lost his footing. Malachi reached out to stop him falling as the ground continued to shake. The sound of laughter echoed across its peaks. Enough, witch, 
roared Malachi. He stretched out his hand and spoke to the mountain in a thundering voice, Be silent! Within seconds, the mountain stopped shaking and the storm died down. Luke was amazed to see the clouds part to allow a burst of sunlight to shine through. He looked at the prophet with awe on his face. She obeys you, he said. Yes, but her power grows daily, said Malachi. She has made new alliances who are intent on plunging this land into darkness. They must be stopped or the white chapel will fall. Malachi and Luke continued their trek until they saw the high walls of the white chapel beneath them. As they approached it, a strange refrain assaulted their ears. What's that awful noise, said Malachi. Brother Cornelius likes to sing, said Luke. He's working in the field. But he hasn't got a note in his head, said Malachi in amazement. How can you bear to work with him? We've tried stopping him, but he's almost deaf, said Luke. The curly haired Cornelius abandoned his work when he saw Malachi and came hurrying across the fields to meet him. Is it really you, prophet, he said, slapping him on the shoulder. His weather beaten face was beaming. You are welcome here. It's a great honour to have you here. Thank you, Cornelius. What? I said thank you, said Malachi, raising his voice. Speak up, prophet. Stop mumbling. I said, you must be hungry, Malachi, interrupted Luke, as he ushered the prophet through a small gate in the wall. They crossed an inner courtyard and entered the back door into a large kitchen. A bony figure lay slumped over the big oak table. From the loud snoring noise he made, it was clear that he was sound asleep. Brother Jeremiah, said Malachi in a loud voice. The hermit's head jerked forwards and he opened his twinkling eyes. Malachi, he said, I've been expecting you. I wish I could have got here sooner, said the prophet sitting down at the table. It's good to see you again, my brother. These are difficult times. The witch is stirring up the volcano. But we are survivors, Malachi. My concern is for the portal. Its power has been considerably weakened as a result of what happened in Zebulon. I'm sending Luke there, said Malachi. I thought you would, said Jeremiah. Can you manage without me, Jeremiah? Luke asked. The work here is hard. <laughs> You've only been here for three years, my boy. I've been here for more than half a century. We've survived before you came and we'll do it again. And I know that you're growing restless. I've just been waiting for you to admit it. I didn't realise it was that obvious. We always knew you would leave us, boy, when your time came. And I have a great friend in Zebulon who'll be able to help you. His name is Dominic Logos. Unfortunately, it's been years since I met him. I spent some time studying in the great libraries of Zebulon when I was younger. Dominic was the head librarian at the Royal Library. He was also a close confidant and advisor to the king. He told me that he visited the portal himself many times with King Zares. There are several ancient books in the library relating to the portal. Be sure to find him and tell him you are a friend of mine. I know he will do everything in his power to help you. And as the king's confidant, there is a chance that Dominic knows where the key to the portal is, said Malachi. So now get ready, boy. There's not much time left. After bidding farewell to his companions at the White Chapel, Luke departed for the Gap of Anver with Malachi. As they climbed, Malachi told him many things about the trouble in the eastern lands. He turned to leave him on the border to the south. Kerry and Simon will meet you in Zebulon, said Malachi. Watch out for them. With that, Luke and Malachi parted. As Luke watched the prophet go, he spotted a tiny man in big hobnailed boots chasing after him. Malachi waited for him to catch up and almost instantly they both disappeared from sight. Luke travelled onwards alone through strange and dark lands. He passed through places that he had never seen before, places he had only imagined visiting in his dreams.
and we're at the end of chapter 13 and we're halfway through the book. Don't forget to subscribe and like and share. Join me on the arcofdonrua.wordpress.com where you can make comments or on Arc Books on Facebook. That's my page, my Facebook page for my books. I'd love to hear what you have to say about it, whether you like it. I love getting comments. I love getting reactions to the story. I hope you love it. Let me know what you think and I'll be back tomorrow with the next chapter. So please join me then. Have a great day and God bless.